I'll uh, do a quick intro here at the mic. Yeah. Oh, can you? Yeah. Cool. Um, hey, everybody. I hope uh, you can see us in San Francisco and on Air Mozilla. Uh, I'm really, really happy that we could have Arvind Narayanan here to speak with us today. I've known Arvind a few years. We've crossed paths in the research community, and he's always been really impressive in uh, being able to use extremely deep knowledge to challenge assumptions that we make, um, assumptions that we like to make in crypto and privacy because we want a better world or uh, want a world where we can better protect our privacy, better protect the secrecy of our data. Uh, you may have heard of the Netflix challenge from a few years ago, which was Arvind's first, but certainly not his last uh, uh, moment of fame. Uh, where uh, Netflix released a whole bunch of records of data to say, hey, b build a better movie recommendation engine. And don't worry, we've anonymized the data, so it's all good. Uh, turns out not so good because uh, Arvind found a way to correlate that database with other databases uh, where people had no problem being public about some movies they watched, but maybe not so public about other movies they watched. So uh, there was a lot of press. 2007, was it? Yeah. 2007. Uh, about that. And uh, like I said, that was the first of Arvind's many accomplishments. Uh, and I think he's got a really interesting talk for us today. So that's all I will say. Welcome, Arvind. Thank you for visiting us. Thanks, Ben. I'm very happy to be here. And I'm not just saying that because in the context of this work that I'm going to talk about, I think browser vendors have a very important role to play. And so this is actually the first time I'm talking about this, and I think this is a very appropriate venue, uh, and I hope you guys are going to find this interesting. So the story begins when a couple of years ago, uh, me and my co-authors at Stanford and NYU, we just finished up a project called Adnostic. This was about privacy-preserving targeted advertising. The motivation here was, you know, we're all being tracked by third parties online all the time. Most of you have probably heard about Do Not Track. But should we necessarily frame this as an inherent conflict between business interests and privacy. Can we sort of have our cake and eat it too? Can we have a technological approach to do this? And that was what Adnostic was about. Uh, we built a concept, proof of concept and a Firefox add-on. What it does is it's an add-on that sits in your browser and profiles uh, all of your web browsing activity. That never leaves the browser, so there is not a real privacy issue. And you're able to do behavioral targeting within the browser itself and uh, hopefully you know, still derive the commercial benefits of that. So that's what we did. We had a good time doing that. And we wanted to collaborate on something else. And we decided to do a survey. And a bunch of different ideas popped up for what it is that we wanted to do a survey about. One of us suggested looking at distributed and federated social networks, which are very different things, by the way although they're often confused. I'll get to that distinction later on. One of us proposed personal data stores, vendor relationship management, that whole movement. But also another thing we wanted to do is agnostic itself was part of a trend of uh, privacy intermediaries and also what are called infomediaries. So we said, why don't we survey that space? And as we were thinking about all these things, we realized something remarkable which is that if you look at all of these from a distance, all, all of these six different things and you know, three broad categories, they're all ultimately very, very similar things. They have very, very similar goals. They may have somewhat different political motivations. They may have somewhat different technical designs. But what they're all trying to accomplish is the following. Uh, they're all technical efforts which, are, which come out of, of frustration about the trend of centralization that we're seeing. Right? Because the internet began as a decentralized medium but the web today is increasingly tending towards centralization, whether it's cloud email, social networks, uh, you know, health data, you name it, right? So all of these are fundamentally in opposition to this trend. And hey, let's, let's change this by building technology and giving people control. And the two key themes that keep popping up, one is privacy and freedom and control, and the other is a sort of market efficiency, uh, which is a little bit of a more subtle notion, and uh, I'll explain what I mean by that. And so once we said, okay, uh, this is great. There's a, a connection between all of these projects. Let's look at all of them in the same framework. We fell through a rabbit hole. Uh, it turns out this, 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 this set of ideas goes back like 15 years. Uh, and uh, you know, it's coming from so many different sub-communities, most of which turn out not to be aware of each other. We found so many wonderful ideas in the literature, some long forgotten. In the end, we ended up surveying more than 80 projects and papers and proposals and products. 
So this is coming from hobbyists and activists, right, and startups and companies. It's coming from groups like artists uh, and, you know, and the academics, of course, so many different quarters. And so we looked at all this, and by, oh, by, the, by the time we had done this, it was the better part of a year, and 20 more had popped up, right? And what we found was there was so much reinvention, and people were falling into a lot of the same pitfalls. And so we really wanted to get the word out there and sort of do the survey and identify some of the common ideas and themes and also what some of the barriers are here. Uh, and so that's what we ended up doing. The position paper that we wrote was called A Critical Look at Decentralized Personal Data Architectures. Uh, and that's uh, mostly what I, what I want to tell you about today. So the funny thing about this was that this was a position paper written by five people with you know slightly different positions on this, uh, which turned out to be actually a really fun experience. And I think you know we learned a lot by comparing and contrasting our positions with each other. And we definitely see this as an ongoing conversation. This is the first step of this. And I also want to emphasize that this is not in any way about criticizing other people's work because our own previous work, Agnostic, you know, is totally included as part of this uh, broad broad movement that I'm talking about. So we ourselves had a vested interest in decentralization. And so this was as much a memoir to ourselves as it was to anybody else. It's, it also makes it uh, tricky to talk about this work because on the one hand, I want to make sure that I don't want to put words in my co-author's mouths, right? Because you know we all have somewhat different opinions, but uh, I also don't want to take uh, credit for a joint effort. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to you know um, walk that tightrope, but it, I'm probably going to err in one way or the other, uh, and I apologize in advance for that. So again, so the reason that, w that we did this is not to tell people not to build these things, but to say if you're going to build this, you know, be aware of what's been done before uh, and what are what are the problems that people have uh, run into, and uh, what are some suggestions for doing it better. So let's begin at the beginning. What we found is that this idea of an info mediary, will, which I'll explain, goes back about 15 years. Who's heard of All Advantage? Okay, great. That's great. Some of you have heard of it. Um, that's awesome because I actually haven't. This was before my time. I wasn't even on the internet in any meaningful way in the 90s. And so it was all the more humbling uh, for me to look at what had been written so long ago. And so this, um, these claims that they have here were startlingly similar to what we were saying with agnostic. Let's look at the highlighted parts. We continually track and collect data, accurate and detailed personal profiles while maintaining the privacy of individuals, highly targeted ads based on websites like specific web, uh, based on variables like specific websites specific. Right. So very similar to what we were trying to do with Agnostic, one way to look at this is to say, oh, of course, there are very different things in Agnostic. All the data is sitting in your browser and all, all advantage, it's on the server and that kind of thing, You know, which is a valid point. It's the typical computer science way of looking at it. But one of the points that we're actually making in this paper is that from the user perspective, they're not all that different because especially given the, that we're in a world with automatic software updates, how different is it really? that you're trusting a piece of software right, that deals with data that's stored locally, which is going to update itself. If that software render, vendor were, were malicious, at any time they could roll out an update to every user that, you know, that would steal their data. And there is a spectrum all the way between these two extremes. In fact, one of the other competitors in this space uh, had a proposal where they were going to collect data on the server, but there would be cryptographic protections and so on. And so when you look at that, the trust model in, in all of these cases is almost identical from a user perspective. So that's kind of one of the assumptions that we want to challenge here, that purely by moving data uh, you know, to the end nodes that you're solving a lot of problems. So anyway, so all advantage was part of the first wave of infomediaries. Uh, you, you know, this, this was not an isolated startup. This was not one single company. Here were some other things that I found. There were many many dozen pay to serve companies. There were so many imitators. $175 million in venture capital for all advantage. It was a top 20 website. And just to make the point that it was a very uh, privacy focused company that was the core of their business model, they actually appointed the world's first chief privacy officer. And the other thing that was interesting for me, of course, I wasn't there, this is, this is all secondhand, uh, but looking at the literature at the time, looking at things like this book called Net Worth, which describes uh, you know, a, a new way of doing commerce uh, via these infomediaries. 
looking at articles like the dawn of the infomediary, again, this is all late 90s and why, right? Not to be outdone, the economist wrote about, sorry, the rise of the infomediary. So the tone of the writing at the time seems to be that people almost made the assumption that this was going to be the paradigm for commerce going forward. That users were not going to directly interact with commercial entities, that everything was going to go through these infomediaries. Right? And what happened? Yeah, yeah, I mean, all of these companies uh, failed. This is, this is a concept that's been tried in the market and didn't quite work out. One way to look at it is, is to say, oh, they all went down in the bust, uh, or they were all ahead of their time. But that's not quite the case. Academic economists have retrospectively taken a look at what happened here. It turns out there are you know, fairly fundamental economic barriers that they run into. If you're interested in those issues, one um, paper that I would recommend is by, is actually a thesis by Bethany Likely, I believe is the name. Well, all of the uh, works that I will mention, they are all cited in the paper that was sent out to you as part of the abstract. So uh, if you're interested in that at all, feel free to look that up. All right, so that was you know, the, the first wave of these infomediaries. And then in the early 2000s, all of that was forgotten. And then there was a wave of these things all over again in the latter part of the last decade. And now this came up under very uh, different names, personal data store, personal data locker, personal data vault, uh, personal clouds. And then there was another movement of vendor relationship management. The ideas are startlingly similar. Some of these white papers and manifestos, you know, read like they, were, they could have been written by the same person. But it was, for the most part, I mean, it's hard to generalize here, you know, because I'm looking at so many different projects. But for the most part, it was a reinvention or rediscovery of all those old ideas. So that's one thread. Another parallel development is that of uh, trying to decentralize social networks. And so this, again, really gained prominence in the latter part of the, of the last decade. So let's, uh, let's get some terminology squared out here. Uh, very often, decentralized social networks are, uh, I think, mistakenly called distributed social networks. And the key difference is that both distributed and federated social networks are a type of decentralized social network, but they're different. Uh, in, a, in a truly distributed system, it's sort of like BitTorrent. There's no real server. It's more of a peer-to-peer -peer thing. right? Whereas a federated social network is more like email. There is a concept of a client and server. But the difference, unlike a centralized system like Facebook, is that anybody can set up a server. There's an open protocol. And hopefully there's a market, you know, partly based on people's privacy needs, different service providers competing on <coughs> privacy, and then you can choose whichever one you want. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of how you get the decentralization guarantee there. Those are the two different models. Does this make sense? Great. So this is also... Uh, so, so when I talk to my academic peers, you know, for the longest time there was the sense that, oh, social networking is just a fad, it's, you know, nothing that we need to worry about. This idea that some of these centralized service providers would sort of try and take control over our, our identity and our relationships and that it would be a threat to a lot of, uh, you know, freedoms and autonomy that we're used to, it didn't take hold either, as far as I can see, either in the academic community or in the hobbyist community for a very long time. Uh, and people were used to dismissing them as fads. And then, you know, in 2008 or so, this, um, uh, you know, distrust and resentment about Facebook built up. And that's when a lot of these, uh, the momentum kind of got going here. And I think the best article that encapsulates the essence of this is this one from Wired. Do some of you remember this? This was from 2010, right? This was around the time of the F8 developer conference in, uh, in the summer of 2010. That's when they simultaneously announced a lot of their sort of privacy uh, infringing uh, features or what, what were viewed as privacy infringing features, and then the pot kind of bo uh, boiled over, and a lot of different projects were started. It was around the time also when Diaspora was funded, right, to the tune of $200,000. Funny story, there were other projects like Appleseed, which were trying to do, you know, very similar kinds of things uh, many, many years ago, and then there was a lack of interest, and then things petered out, and when Diaspora got all this uh, money and all, and, the, and all the New York Times articles, the uh, Appleseed guys were like, hey, wait a minute, we've been saying these same things for such a long time. And then they kind of rebounded together and started up their project again and tried to get some of their own news attention, et cetera. Um, but again, you know, for all that excitement, nothing much has, has come out of it. And that's kind of what motivated our work, to see what was in common here and why these have uh, had a, a, a lot of trouble in the market. So 
Um, so uh, let me come back briefly to what I mentioned earlier. There have been two major motivations driving all of these efforts. Uh, one is this notion of privacy or freedom, either in a more pragmatic sense that you know I, I should be able to control uh, control my data and protect it from government surveillance or corporate surveillance or whatever, or in a more abstract sense like. Um, why does a company even have control over my life? How can they decide to uh, you know, terminate my account? Uh, this is a fundamental social justice issue. So there is a class of motivations there that I'm encapsulating under privacy and freedom. There is another set of issues which is particularly relevant when we're talking about things like vendor relationship management or infomediaries, or even to some extent for social networks. People are also very upset about the fact that there are so many switching costs, right? Uh, between different products, you know, uh, we don't have very good portability, and also in a commercial sense, you have different actors each collecting their data and competing with each other, and so this diminishes uh, social welfare from the user point of view. So that's that's another whole set of motivations uh, that comes into play. Um, I, from what I've seen, the majority of the projects have privacy as their major motivation, and the latter one as secondary, but it could be the other way around. But those end up being. Uh, broadly, the two major themes, and of course, those are goals you know that we can all agree with, right? I'm, I'm not in any way trying to disparage these goals; these are very important goals. But there are some practical problems. All right. So before I get into the whole, what are what are some of the drawbacks part of this? One of the things that was very interesting and inspiring and enlightening to me was that there have been so many wonderful ideas uh, that have been. Uh, proposed in all of these efforts over the last 15 years. And I wanted to give you a very quick survey of these. It's not going to be a complete survey, you know, and in many cases I'm going to be forced to devote one sentence to a whole paper or whatever. But just to give you a flavor, and also just to make the point that anybody, you know, starting one of these efforts would do well to see what's already been done before because there's such a rich set of ideas and there is so much to learn from them, uh, both good and bad. Let me start with some of the non technical ideas. The first one I want to talk about is sort of the simple, obvious idea of markets, but it turns out to be a little bit more subtle. Two types of markets, attention market and a personal data market. Attention markets, some of you might look at it and say, why are you talking about it as sort of a new idea that didn't take off? Uh, there is a huge attention market and it's happening all the time every day on the internet. Do you guys know which one I'm talking about? Exactly. Advertising auctions are a type of attention market. But I want to contrast that with the kind of ideas that have been explored in some of these projects and companies and papers, which is the notion of making this attention market explicit, bringing the user into the loop, right? And, and making the monetary proposition uh, also an, an explicit trade-off. You're, you know, you're giving up your attention for a certain period of time, and we value your time at this amount, and so you get compensated so many cents or so many dollars, that kind of explicit deal. And you know that that is just so fascinating to me. Um, so, and, and the same kind of difference with the personal data market. You decide to give up, uh, you know, your birthday to this company, and then you get compensated X amount of dollars. It's it's just fascinating to think about a world, you know, a hypothetical world where that's how things would work. It just uh, throws up so many uh, exciting questions in behavioral economics and also in information economics. How do you value personal data and so on? And, and, and those are really wonderful to think about. A lot of academic papers have explored those ideas. Uh, some companies have tried, you know, didn't quite work out, but I think it's still very interesting and worth looking at. The next idea is from the legal realm. It's the idea of licensing of infomediaries. And I just have to put an exclamation point at the end of it because to me, this was the most uh, novel idea in all the papers that I read. Uh, probably because you know I'm a technical person and not a legal person. Uh, but it, it's, I just found this um, super interesting. Uh, these guys, so this was, uh, this was from a specific paper, I think, by some UCLA people. Again, all the citations are going to be in our paper. They proposed, why not have a personal data guardian, which is a profession? And that's a key point. Uh, you know, a profession is something that has legal meaning, like a lawyer or a doctor, and it would come with its own code of conduct and responsibilities and regulation and legal liabilities and so on. Right? And uh, you know, there are so many nitty-gritty legal details to work out. If, uh, if, if there were a subpoena, would such a personal data guardian be forced to give up your data? How does that work out and so on? But assuming we can have the proper legal protections, 
it's just fascinating to think about in this kind of world would people be just you know much more comfortable dealing with these infomediaries right so because this is a way to realize this idea of an infomediary uh, instead of directly dealing with Google or Facebook or Amazon and uh, would this in fact uh, be the key business incentive that you need in order to make this whole world feasible so like a lot of academic work you know this the idea here is not to make this happen tomorrow but you know that's a great thing about you know just being able to think out these thoughts right so that's the sense in which I'm presenting it and the authors are very much aware of that it's, it's something fascinating to think about and the third idea is from the intersection of law and economics uh, this is by a paper by Eric Goldman Santa Clara Law the School of Law he asks what would happen in a world, so again, I, I'm simplifying a little bit. He talks about a lot of things in his paper. The paper is titled uh, Cozy and Analysis of Marketing. He asks, what would happen if our smartphones had all of our data and, you know, had sort of perfect AI and we could do perfect targeting of commercial messages or marketing messages and so on? Would the problem essentially solve itself? Will the market solve the problem appropriately compensating people for their uh, personal data and for intruding on their time? Would we be able to live without any regulation at all? Again, it's you know something very interesting to think about. Uh, targeting is always getting better and better, but this would really make a lot more sense in this decentralized model. That that's that's kind of what he has in mind, where your data stays on your smartphone and has all of your information, like your location movements, et cetera, et cetera and it does perfect targeting, hey, let's think about the consequences of what that world would look like. Let me now go to some of the technical ideas that have been proposed. Uh, the first one I want to uh, talk about is actually a collection of ideas that come up in response to the key question that one asks with decentralized social networks and also with uh, a lot of these other projects. It's kind of the who will build the cat question, right? Because it, you know, it's great to say there should be separate servers or whatever, and people will run this, but why will they run this? You know, uh, who, who will have the monetary incentive to provide that service? If users are going to have to do it themselves, you know, they're not going to have the inclination or the technical competence to be running servers. There have been a variety of solutions that have been proposed. Let's look at a few which involve interesting types of hardware. Uh, these are three different solutions. The first one is from a paper called Visa uh, V. What they propose is, hey, what if everybody had their own EC2 instance? And they completely acknowledge that today, you know, it's a little bit cost prohibitive, but Moore's Law, blah, blah. Eventually, maybe it'll probably turn into uh, the, the cost situation would be something like one of those magazine subscriptions, like a few dollars a year that you don't even really think about. So if we lived in a world where everybody kind of automatically got their own EC2 instance, can we realize a lot of the uh, plans for distributed and decentralized social networking? Right. Of course, one tricky issue there is you have to prevent the uh, cloud provider themselves from snooping on your data because that's still a threat, and so you have to solve some technical issues. Uh, they kind of do that sort of thing. And so that's another sort of hypothetical thing to think about. Another project that proposes a totally different solution, Freedom Box, and if you may have heard of it, right? Uh, it's by Avon Moglin uh, or the FSF, I don't remember what it is. Uh, the idea is that you build a cheap plug-in computer, like an Arduino or something, and then you just plug it into a wall and forget about it. Uh, I don't, I don't think it's really taken off. Again, there's a lot of tricky issues. You know, who's going to be responsible for the software and updates and configuration and all of that? But it, at least as, as, um, as a starting point for solving the hardware cost hosting challenge, it's an interesting way to think about it because, you know, you make the trade-off very clear to the, to the user, right? You want decentralization and control over data. Uh, you pay X amount of dollars for acquiring this device and for connectivity. So, uh, yeah, so that's another paradigm that's been proposed. This last one is uh, by a group at Stanford, headed by Professor Monica Lamb. What they say is, let's explore what we can do with a purely smartphone-based social network, more or less with no server. And they completely acknowledge that in this model, you'll only be able to do ephemeral things, right? Because phones are not very good at uh, you know, storing past uh, data or really having a server type uh, functionality. But their insight is that there is a lot of social networking functionality that we only want on an ephemeral basis, like you know, figuring out what movie to go to between a bunch of friends or whatever. And so if we can build all of those things in a peer-to-peer -peer model and package it, uh, well, that, is that going to be commercially attractive to the users? And they've actually built it, and they've, I think they've put it on the Android market. Uh, it's fairly new. Uh, I think the overall project is called Social. Uh, it's very interesting. I, I really hope it takes off. 
Um, me and another student have also contributed some code and ideas to this, so we'll see what happens there. Another idea that comes up again and again in response to this challenge of uh, who's going to host it and what's going to be their incentive is this idea of piggybacking. And again, there are several different groups and projects. Uh, this first one is again by the same group of people I just talked about, Professor Monica Lamb's group at Stanford. But it's a very, very different kind of proposal. Let's build a decentralized social network where all the message passing, you know, and the notifications and everything will be sent as email messages. And this will presumably be a separate email account, you know, it's not intruding on your regular email. But there will be a client, right, that uses email as its backend using IMAP or whatever protocol. It translates all of those photos or notifications, whatever, uh, from email, which is treated purely as a dumb pipe of protocol, into this interface, you know, presumably a Facebook-like interface on the client side. So that I find is a fascinating concept. Uh, maybe Google will try to block it with your terms of service. I don't know what the answer is to that, but presumably it'll be, uh, you know, then you can have a legal challenge to that. You know, you have a right to make use of your email in whatever manner you choose. Another project called Frenzy, I believe, says let's use Dropbox as a backend for a decentralized social networking. Another interesting idea because you know a lot of people are already used to paying for a Dropbox. So let's so the piggybacking here is sort of in the sense of uh, piggybacking on something that the user is already used to, right? It's, it's not necessarily technical, but from a user perspective. Another project called Polaris says that. Um, Let's separate the hosting of content from the management of content, again, in the context of distributed social networks, completely separate. Not the same companies, not the same interface. And so all of the, um, the hosting of content will be offloaded to YouTube and Flickr and so on, and you know, they have access control features. But all of the actual social networking, the graph, right, and the sharing, uh, presumably message passing, commenting, and all of that, you do it with a smartphone based interface and that's totally different and now you don't have any uh, difficult hosting requirements anymore so that's another approach for it. All right, there's a couple more ideas that I want to talk about. Let me loop very quickly through them. Uh, let me just explain the problem here. The uh, solutions are technically involved and I will refer you to the papers again. And the problem that these guys are trying to solve is how do you do access control in a decentralized social network. Again, different types of sol uh, solutions. So. Let me explain the problem a little bit more. The problem is that in a decentralized social network, you know, if you only want to share certain status updates, whatever, only with your friends, there are two tensions. One tension is that like BitTorrent, in order to have reliability of the network, right, in order to have maximum possible availability, you want to redundantly propagate those messages as much as possible. Right? But in order to have privacy, you can't really do that. You want to limit the distribution of those messages. Again, this defines privacy as access control. In a little bit, I'm going to argue that that's a very limited conception of privacy. But even just to do the basic privacy as access control thing, you start running into these difficulties. So, so one of the ideas, for example, is social repl replication. Let's Let's look at the relationship between the topology of the network and the topology of the social graph and sort of exploit that to optimally come up with a strategy of who is going to redundantly duplicate what messages and so on. Uh, various interesting ideas. Diaspora proposes a distributed, a hybrid of federated and distributed networks. There are these concept of pods and I think, well, I haven't fully understood it, but what I think is depending on how many people decide to take control and install these pods, the network can end up looking like something that's either fully distributed or uh, really federated. And the idea is, hey, let's, let's let people decide and build a technical infrastructure that seamlessly supports either of them and any, anything in between. Right. There's another uh, interesting idea with OSTatus. Let me skip past that. Uh, let me move on to the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is what are some of the major uh, drawbacks that, uh, that we've identified here. So before that, I want to emphasize that we're making two major claims in the paper. They're related, but they're different. The first major claim is that all of these systems, they face tough barriers to adoption. And the second claim is that even if adopted, uh, people assume that simply because of decentralization, interoperability, etc., Social values like privacy and other things will automatically follow from that, and we're challenging that assumption as well. So those are the two claims that we're making. And the drawbacks that I'm going to identify, again, it's not an exhaustive list. I'll present some of the major ones we've identified in the paper, 
but they're used to argue these two broad fact, these claims that, that we're making. Does that make sense? Okay. So let me uh, split this into a few different categories. The first one is a, is a set of technical factors. We've identified a bunch of them. These are all things that become very difficult to do if you're in a decentralized setting, if you don't have a centralized uh, control as well, as well as access to the data. Let me zoom in on just one of those, which is spam detection. Here's something interesting. You know, do you guys remember about a decade ago when there were so many articles uh, claiming that email was soon dying because of the exponential growth of spam, right? And if you think about it today, sure, it's an annoyance, but we pretty much have it under control. Why did that happen? Uh, here's my hypothesis for why it happened. This is a chart of Google Trends interest for the keyword spam. And you can see there is a precipitous drop starting in 2004. And uh, these days, it's about one-fifth of its earlier value. So I want to identify 2004 as the time that something changed. What changed? My hypothesis is that the, one of the key changes was that Gmail was introduced, and, and there was a huge and increasing shift to cloud email. And once you have you know, the centralized view of the data, machine learning to identify spam versus non-spam becomes so much easier. And I think that was uh, the key change, or one of the key changes uh, that led to the decrease in the spam problem. It's, it's, you know, it's somewhat speculative. I don't have definitive proof that this was the, the main reason. Uh, but for each of those factors that um, I've identified, we can certainly come up with concrete algorithmic reasons why they're dramatically easier to implement in a centralized than in a decentralized fashion. Moving on. Uh, we've also identified a set of economic reasons. Uh, one, of, uh, one of them is standards and path dependence. So what I'm trying to um, identify here is the difference between sort of a consensus-based approach, right, which is how we used to do things when it comes to new uh, features or protocols on the internet, versus the way that companies do it today. And you know, sort of which one is easier in the marketplace, right? And I think an important factor deciding that is this economic notion of path dependence. Are you guys familiar with what path dependence is? Uh, a couple of you. Okay. So let me explain that. So path dependence says that a system could be in two different states of stable equilibrium. Right? However, uh, if you're in one, it's very difficult to go to the other. And if you're in the other one, it's very difficult to come back to this one. And so just due to sort of random historical factors, a business could have evolved in one of, one of two directions. And depending on which one you're in, it's going to be very difficult to change to the other. And so the hypothesis is that something similar to that applies to centralized versus decentralized systems. Let's look at email. It started out as decentralized, right, protocol-based, and it became very popular as a decentralized network. And so even though, you know, we've moved to cloud-based email and so on, and companies definitely have a strong incentive, right, to sort of take control over your email and not necessarily interoperate, that hasn't happened because decentralized email is a stable equilibrium. Right? Centralized messaging, I want to claim, is also a stable equilibrium, like Facebook messages. You know, Facebook has been completely immune to pressure, right, to open up their messaging infrastructure, uh, really, to interoperate with email or whatever. In fact, recently there was a story of how they're trying to take control <coughs> of your email addresses that you've posted on their profile. Have you guys seen that? So that's the issue that I want to highlight here. We talk about a bunch of economic reasons, but this is one in particular that I wanted to highlight. Moving on, a variety of cognitive factors. These are you know, really easy to appreciate, so I'm not going to spend too much time on them. There's an extra software installation barrier for decentralized systems. There are more decisions, et cetera, et cetera. Let me now come to three factors that I think are some of the uh, key things we've identified in the paper and somehow really don't get talked about a lot. And so the first of these is that a lot of decentralized systems, especially decentralized social networks, kind of have the wrong model of privacy. And what I mean by that is they're all a reaction to the privacy threat of centralized surveillance. However, I think what studies show and also what anecdotal evidence show is that the kind of threat that people care much more about is their nosy neighbors or their snooping friends or their cheating spouses. Right? And when you look at that kind of privacy threat, decentralization makes things a lot worse. Who here hasn't lost a phone or doesn't know anyone who's lost a phone? Anybody? Not really, right? I don't think so. And so if you're in the model 
of storing everything on the client side, when you try to, you know, when you know, when you go and explain that to users, a lot of the time they're more concerned about privacy because this is the type of threat they're, that they're much more worried about. Somebody who borrows their phone will have, you know, access to all their information, or if they lose their phone, they're going to be in trouble and so on. That's kind of what I mean by lateral privacy here, and I'm borrowing that term from other authors. Uh, privacy between peers rather than privacy, you know, from a corporation uh, or from a government. Just to give you one more concrete example of what is a, a very fascinating way in which a centralized system um, does things to make lateral privacy better, which doesn't fit into the access control model at all, which is what all the decentralized systems are focused on. On Google+, Plus, have you guys seen, if you try to share a limited post with another limited circle, it'll pop up a little, you know, sort of nudge. It'll be like, hey, this person shared this with a limited group of people. Think about what you're doing, right? So what is going on here is that the centralized system is enforcing some common norms, common social norms, for all of the users of that system. And those kind of central norms, which are not part of the technical measures at all, are a very key component of how people conceptualize privacy in a system and how they get comfortable with it. You want to have some guarantee that once you do something, right, once your friend has access to it, they're going to behave in a certain way. And you cannot technically enforce that because that information has left your system. Right? But if you're in a sort of a shared world with some shared norms, then you get much more uh, of a privacy comfort out of it. So that is something, you know, again, I see the decentralized systems are going to have a lot of difficulty with that. Another assumption that we challenge in our paper is the idea that you can provide privacy by giving people control. And so we did a thought experiment uh, of what does perfect control even mean? What would it take for a person to have perfect control over their personal data? And once you start doing the, that thought experiment, you realize it's very, very tricky because, uh, for example, we live in a world of instant software updates, right? So who is going to certify those nightly updates and make sure they're not stealing your data, et cetera, et cetera? Do you have control over the hardware infrastructure if you're using your own EC2 instance, whatever? Uh, there are a variety of issues that we identify. Another issue that comes up here is what's going to happen to your data once you send it legitimately to a company who wants access to it or you send it to a friend, there is no way of technically enforcing control. And then we realize that we're back to this world of needing some legal or regulatory means to in enforce privacy anyway, which makes us realize that it's not a question of getting away from all that and having a purely technical mechanism, but really more about where we want to draw the line. Yeah. So that's another sort of different way of thinking that we try to promote in our paper. Another one is um, the difference between open standards and interoperability. So very broadly, the argument that we're making in our paper boils down to the idea that the great thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from. You guys probably heard of that aphorism, right? And we found that this is actually happening when it comes to federated social networks because there are 40 or 50 of them, and all of them claim to be based on open standards. There's actually a matrix of interoperability that someone, uh, in fact, made online in a wiki, and, you know, it's not looking so great. Why is that? So even at the very basic level of identity, different identity standards are duking it out. And once you get to things that are more complex than that, there is just an incredible array of parameters to nail down. Let me give you a funny example. Um, status.net, who's heard of status.net and Identica? Right, most of you have, right? So um, I, I believe it's Identica, but one of these decentralized systems, even though they have no particular reason to, they actually limit their status updates to 140 characters because they want to maintain compatibility with Twitter. So even if, you know, you have, you're all speaking the same open standard, uh, it's very difficult to see how you're going to independently innovate on features while also preserving compatibility, like, you know, character limits. And this is the simplest possible medium. It's just text. Just the length of text already introduces constraints and how much you can innovate. Think about a more complex moving target like Facebook, right? If you want to simultaneously innovate and also maintain interoperability and compatibility, what does that even mean? How can you? I'm, I'm not really seeing that, and so there seems to be something missing here. Another thing we tried to highlight in the paper. All right. So my intention here today is totally not to be negative, so let me get to some recommendations. But while I don't think, you know, it's, um, it's, it's very feasible to just completely upset the balance of power and take control with decentralized systems, I do think these are very important, and I think there's a lot that needs to be done, perhaps with some more modest goals and also sort of hybrid goals. Uh, and so, uh, so let's look at what some of those are. The first thing I want to say is that it would be good to embrace regulation. And this is in a variety of ways. 
I think it's good to embrace regulation simply, you know, while we're working on decentralized systems so that we can better cope with the fact that the centralized systems are here to stay and they are going to have your data and, you know, let's put some controls over it. I've been very involved in the Do Not Track project. Uh, I know a lot of people are cynical about, you know, government interference, but I, I kind of have a more optimistic view. I'd be happy to have that discussion later on uh, with anyone who's interested. That's kind of where I come down on that. Another important factor uh, that's perhaps underappreciated is that regulation can really, really help in terms of the economic incentives for some of these decentralized projects. Because currently, the two are not in a level playing field. You don't have basic transparency, for example. Companies don't have to tell you, you know, to whom else they're sending that data, right? And um, uh, you don't have basic opt-out privileges uh, out of a lot of these centralized systems. So, so the point of incentive shift is another important uh, goal for regulation, or important objective. And the other thing is, even if we are going the route of decentralized systems, let's not say the privacy protection is going to be only technical. Let's also augment that in terms of rules and regulations for what's going to happen to your data after it's le left to your system. So that's another way in which regulation plays a role, even if we are, do want to live in a decentralized world. Second point I want to make, I think there can be specific demographics and use cases where decentralized systems have a much higher probability of succeeding. Here are just a couple that we've identified in the paper. Uh, people fighting against censorship and surveillance, right? Almost by definition, they want to get, they desperately want to get away from the centralized model. So even if our goal is to build decentralized systems that will be used by a broader majority of people, I think it's good to start from such a, a concrete use case uh, and get it out there into the hands of people and then try to figure out how to extend that to make it useful to more people. And I think microblogging is another use case that falls into this category. And the reason for it is that it's a stable set of features. It's, it's much easier to be in a sort of standards-based, consensus-based approach if you're talking about a stable set of features than if you're talking about a, a moving target like Facebook. Does that distinction kind of make sense? Okay. So uh, the third one is uh, what we call conceptual fidelity in the paper. It's a pompous sounding phrase, but all we're saying is figure out what people want. And I'm going to make a controversial claim here. Typically, what they want is not protection from surveillance. Now, let me be clear. Surveillance by corporations or by government is an issue that people care about. They do want to do something about it. However, what they want to do about it is they want to solve that problem by voting for the right candidate or by pressuring companies to change their practices. They do not see uh, you know, individuals installing technology as the way to do anything about surveillance. And let me make a controversial analogy here, in fact. So if you're telling people, hey, there are all these problems with companies and governments collecting your data, you have to do something about it, you have to inconvenience yourself and install software, the way that the average person looks at that is similar to a gun nut who is concerned about government abuse of power and stocks up in their bunker on gums and ammo. Right. So it's not in the sense that they look at you as, you know, as a nut, but in the sense that it's a completely disproportionate amount of user effort that you're asking them to go through in order to solve something that's not an individual problem. It's not a problem specific to you. It's a societal and policy problem. And so they want to solve that not through individual efforts, but by, you know, changing the way that society works, regulation, whatever. On the other hand, if you're talking about the whole, you know, nosy friend or a cheating spouse kind of privacy threat, that's an individual privacy. That's your problem. So people are comfortable with the fact that you have to take control over that. You have to take responsibility for that. So people think of these two things in very different ways. And so if we're telling them, if we're handing out technological tools to them to protect themselves against this threat, we're handing out info hats. So, yeah, again, I know it's going to be controversial, but that's kind of the way I look at it. All right. So let me get to some of the final points I want to make. I think browser vendors have a very crucial role here. I've been talking for a while about, uh, in a few venues, about this notion of uh, browser as privacy intermediary. There was that whole failed wave of info intermediaries, right? And there's this new wave of privacy intermediaries. Now, a browser is not going to be like a distributed social network, but I think there is a very strong argument to be made that a browser can be a successful privacy intermediary. And one reason for it is that already, just by their nature, uh, browsers don't have many of these drawbacks that I identified earlier on. For example, uh, it's, it's a piece of software that users already trust, and they trust the brand, et cetera, which is one of the things we identified in the paper. 
And I think increasingly, correct me if I'm wrong, browser vendors have a cloud infrastructure uh, for, a, for a lot of specific purposes. And one of the things that we say in our paper is that one way in which these decentralized infrastructures can work if, is if you move to a hybrid centralized decentralized model, where some of the things do happen in a centralized fashion, do happen with some kind of centralized, uh, even if only aggregate data collection, while you gain some privacy benefits by keeping some of the more sensitive data on the client side. And I think browsers are in a good position to do that. Uh, obvious uh, factor, no software installation ba barrier. And I think I kind of think browser is the obvious place to put your identity. I also think it's the obvious place to put various things like social connections and things like uh, a basic level of encryption capability. I've worked on a project called Social Keys. Happy to talk about it later if anyone is interested. So I, I think browser is the obvious nexus for all of those things to go in. And if you do all that, you're already you know three fourths of the way toward being a privacy intermediary. Let me make some more possibly controversial factors. One of the things I want to say is that platforms increasingly are regulators, whether you like it or not. Uh, you know, whether we're talking about a smartphone platform like Apple or we're talking about a browser platform, people don't necessarily make the distinction between the platform and what's on top of it. And really, you know, the, the trust issue and the um, where people put uh, where people expect the privacy protection to come from is the platform. And I think platforms have to increasingly embrace that role instead of trying to be totally separate from <coughs> what is on top of the platform. Another point I want to make is that defaults matter. In other words, you can't not make a choice. Many of you know what I'm talking about, and some of you are very unhappy that I said that. Uh, I'm talking specifically about do not track, but also more generally. Um, I'm slow this is not what I would have said a month or two ago, but I'm slowly coming around to the point of view that many other academics have that by claiming not to have a default, you are having some kind of default. Um, and the reason I came around to this point of view is not actually because of the do not track debate, but because of reading this wonderful, wonderful book called Not Shoot. Who's read this book? A couple of you, that's great. I, I really recommend this. What it says is, it, you know, the, the metaphor this, that it introduces is this notion of a choice architecture. And in the browser context, what, uh, what, I, what I suppose the authors would say is that you are building a choice architecture for users Defaults are not the only issue here. Every user interface decision that you present to them influences what they're going to do. And so the only question that you have to ask yourself is what kind of choices are you going to enable users to make, not whether you're going to do that or not. So sort of being neutral is not an option. So that's one of the controversial points that I wanted to leave you with. And I really hope that at least you know one or two of the independent browser vendors uh, will actually embrace their roles as um, privacy intermediaries and have a more sort of aggressive and activist stance about this in the years going forward. And I think it really aligns well with, uh, with business interests as well. Okay, so last couple of minutes, kind of more speculative things. I want to talk about what things might look like going forward. And my thinking here, th this has nothing anymore to do with uh, anything we said in the paper. This is just my thinking on this. And it's heavily influenced by this awesome book that I read uh, called The Master Switch by Tim Wu. Uh, he's a law prof. And it amazes me that many of the things he said anticipated what technologists would come to realize a, a year or two later. This is primarily a historical analysis of what he calls information empires. And it includes all of these different things, radio, TV, uh, film, telephony, and the internet. And what amazed me is that there are such striking similarities between the evolution of all of these things. They all started out sort of in a decentralized manner, which was the appropriate economic paradigm when it's still new, when you're still experimenting, you're not clear what the revenue model is, and different people are coming up with different innovations, and they're hooking things up together. And then all of these systems inevitably, inevitably, once they matured and once the pace of innovation inevitably slowed, once the revenue model started becoming clearer, the centralized model clearly went out. And he claims that the same thing is happening and will continue to happen to the internet, an argument that I find very, very compelling. Uh, and he sort of has a little bit of a doomsday picture of it. He says that it's a terrible thing if it happens. I, I'm not so sure about that. I think there are a lot of bad aspects, but you know, it's not, it's not necessary to try to ban these systems. And he comes up with this paradigm called the separations principle, which is kind of like net neutrality on steroids. Uh, which is, for in his conception, partly norms and partly regulation is how he thinks we should actually address this threat. So let me leave you with uh, just one more speculative vignette. 
I think we should pay increasing attention to this notion of digital feudalism, which is a metaphor that's more and more every day coming to describe that the world that we live in. What do I mean by this? One of the concrete things that I mean is that we're seeing vertical integration now between devices, software, and content, between the smartphone platform, between uh, you know the software that runs on it, and also content like iTunes or Google's library or Amazon or whatever. Right? So Google, Amazon, and Apple are clearly some of the major players here. I don't want to speculate about exactly who the companies will end up being in the space and where Facebook's role will be, et cetera, et cetera. But the broader point is that this is how the industry is aligning. Increasingly, all of these are going to be packaged and sold together as a single thing to the user. Right? If that seems a little bit surprising, think about this. How many of you know the brand of the RAM that's installed on your computer? At one point, you know, a few decades ago, not knowing that would have been thought of as absurd because you assembled your own computers. That it's a similar shift to what's happening today. Just like your hardware is prepackaged and sold, right, as a laptop that you buy. And that's the only brand you think about. Are you buying an Apple or a Dell or whatever? Similarly, what you'll be thinking about is, are you going to be in the Google world or the Amazon world or, or, or whoever else's world? And there's going to be tight vertical integration. These walls are going to become more difficult to jump across. That's already happening. Let me give you an example. Android is technically open source, and Amazon's platform for their tablet, et cetera, is techni technically based on Android. But in a practical sense, the interoperability is nil. Right? From the user perspective, these are entirely separate brands. Nobody even knows or cares that, there is the, the, that the underlying software might be the same. So again, this is speculative. This is kind of where um, I see things might be going. And one consequence of this is the privatization of previously public spaces. And um, I don't want to go into detail on that. Again, happy to talk about it later if you're interested. So this is something that I think we should actually worry about. This is one possible way in which things could evolve. Um, and in response to this, I think it's crucial to have some neutral parties that people trust that don't have the incentive to go, you know, to play into one of these vertically integrated uh, worldviews. And that's again where I see the browser's role as being really, really key. And I want to end on that note. Thank you for listening. Any questions for Arvind? And is anybody's monitoring IRC? I forgot to bring my laptop for Air Mozilla. If they want a proxy question, yeah, I'll throw one out. There. Um, so, in your discussion of the privacy properties of distributed social networks, we, we we've been talking a lot about the, them as platforms for privacy. Uh, one of the other things that those networks are really good for is platforms for publicity, mm -hmm. and many of the uh, attempts to make more private social networks have fallen down pretty hard on supporting publicity, which is to say uh, people who want to be found, maybe not entirely, maybe in part, maybe in one of their personas and not in others. Um, I think perhaps um, the Arab Spring would be a good example of how those platforms were actually used as publicity rather than privacy platforms. Um, have you seen anybody that seems to be doing good work on privacy protections in that mode. I that's that's a very interesting point. I've actually not found. Oh, repeat the question. Okay. I think that the mics pick it up, right? Yeah, just summarize. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was about are any of the decentralized social networks also trying to support the need for that some users have, uh, which is publicity, to get their word out to as many people as possible, and also integrate some sort of privacy protection while preserving this need. Uh, that's uh, that's a new concept to me. I've actually not seen that. Thank you for I, bringing that up. I think I got the idea from Dana Boyd. Oh, interesting. Okay, uh, she certainly talks about publicity a lot. That's that's definitely true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess one thing you mentioned was that people do care about surveillance, but they don't see installing software or changing services as a means of actionably affecting that, but instead they prefer to lobby or, you know, whatever else. Is it, did you come across research that indicated that people see their options solely as being surveilled by someone I trust or being surveilled by someone I don't trust and were completely oblivious to the option of just not being surveilled? Um. I think the option of not being surveilled is certainly a big part of the public conversation, and I think Do Not Track is a good example of that. Uh, in the in the two or two years or so that I've been involved in it, I have actually been surprised by, you know, the number of people who show some awareness of it or have turned on the option in browsers. Uh, so that's that's been a pleasant surprise to me.
when you're talking about surveillance, you kind of made this dichotomy between your like lateral privacy and the surveillance, the government, corporations, or whatever. But I guess I kind of think of the groups that are relevant to me in that way. When, you know, first there's people in my own family, and then there's people in the neighborhood, or people in the same IRC channel, or something. Just kind of you know expanding and not not nested, not necessarily nested uh, rings going out. Um, I guess I don't know how that plays in. That's that's what definitely actually care about. right. Uh, that's entirely true. I think those are some of the social nuances that technologists so far haven't been you know fully good at capturing. And I think a big part of the motivation for Google Plus was to at least try to better capture those nuances. And um, a, a great academic uh, study of putting all those social norms and needs and requirements on a sort of a rigorous footing is this work called. Uh, privacy as contextual integrity. I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, the person responsible for that is actually one of the uh, one of my co-authors here, uh, Helen Nissenbaum, uh, who you see in the picture there. Uh, it's, so the, I think the, a fair way to summarize the status of contextual integrity is that we have a fairly good understanding of how to uh, define uh, these uh, needs and norms and requirements that people have, but the work of translating that into technological tools and paradigms hasn't been fully done yet. Uh, so there's still a way to go. Do you have any more examples of the perhaps the user mis uh, the mismatch between users and like technical details? You mentioned one of uh, being the I think it was the all advantage was doing the privacy protecting but on the server, whereas the agnostic was privacy protecting on the client. You mentioned there was this mismatch between user's expectation. Right. Or do you have any other examples? Uh, so uh, one of the other things I was talking about is that you know people care much more about uh, what their friends might see on their phone or on their device. Okay, right. Right. But so that, that was another example of, that, of the same but thing. But like... Oh, more examples? Yeah. Um, let's see. So... So cognitive factors relating to attention markets, I think, would be another mismatch. In, um, in a lot of the technical and economic literature, uh, the way that things are modeled is, you know, you give up a certain amount of your attention, you get paid a certain amount of dollars. And this paradigm shares a limitation with the whole endeavor of micropayments, which is that there is a cognitive cost to making these micro decisions. And I haven't seen that fully captured and modeled. And that's a possible reason why a lot of these systems fell down. Does that make sense? Yeah. So to what extent is the um, necessity to actually understand the model of whatever you know, privacy enhancing system you're using a barrier to adoption? I, I kind of feel like browser ID in particular, people are having some trouble with because they don't understand the basic model behind it and so they're not sure whether they should use it or not. It's just kind of fuzzy. That's a very interesting point. I've seen also user studies uh, showing similar problems with OpenID, which I assume many of you have also seen, right? And I've, um, I've made that point with crypto as well. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, with, um, with Dan Bonet and other authors, we worked on a system for location privacy which would give you the technical guarantee that if you were close to a friend, you know, within a few blocks or whatever, it would pop up a notification on your phone. However, for someone who is not nearby or for the server who's providing you the service, no information about your location is leaked. And then at some point I started thinking, you know, we, we really wanted this to be commercially adopted, but I started thinking if a company were to go and pitch this to users, what exactly would they say? Would they say, we're providing you this location service about where your friends are, but we're never actually seeing your location. They're not even seeing your location. If they did that, ironically, this wouldn't pass people's bullshit filter because that seems like a thing that you can't achieve. And, you know, the average person basically doesn't have a mental model of the fact that crypto even exists. Right? So that's kind of the barrier there. Um, so here's what I would say. It's not necessarily true that they always have to understand what is going on. But they have to be able to believe that this is technically possible. Does that distinction kind of yeah, make, sense? No, that makes sense? Yeah. So I, if you can somehow get on the right side of that, then, then I think you're you're still in good shape. And but once again, you know, if you if the workflow is as complex as OpenID, where you get shuttled between different domains, and it's not clear which brand you're interacting with, 
right, then you get into a whole different host of difficulties, which hopefully I don't think browser ID faces that level of user confusion. So I, I see it, it as being in a better spot. One of the things we've tried to do is not actually make the privacy properties the first thing we pitch, because that's not enough for right. people to adopt it. It's certainly one of the attributes that we have, but it's not what we go out to and say, this is why you want to adopt it. We say, it's easier, which we think it is, and, uh, and oh, by the way, you're respecting your user's privacy better, too, when you put it on your site. But that's not what we say. If you like privacy, use browser ID. That would not be sufficiently sufficient as element one. That's an excellent point. Thank you. I don't, I don't have data to support this, but my, my gut feeling is that consumers make privacy decisions based on their interactions with brands, yes. not their interactions with systems. Yep. Totally. And so if you hit them with two brands or no brands, they may feel less comfortable than yep. a clearly defined interaction with what. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Any questions on IRC before we close? No? We're not seeing any? On Air Mozilla? Anybody on there? No? Okay. Thanks, Arwen. Thank you very much.